kind of a special way to start with you uh, this afternoon uh, because I'm going to show you some of our recent work on understanding food and climate change. And we had planned to release this in, on Earth Day this year. But before that could happen, we received an invitation from the President of the General Assembly of the United Nations to please come and speak there. We'll wait for them. On International Earth Day, uh, which we did on April 23rd. I'm the one on the left. Um, it was a session that was mandated by the President of the General Assembly, so it got the full treatment. You were in the big room, and you had the simultaneous translations and the live stream and all of that. So on April 23, um, we officially did our launch of what I'm going to show you in just a little bit. And I thought what I'd do is just share with you a little bit of the UN presentation as an introduction to the work. Um, so. Our mission is education for sustainable living. And in case you're not an educator, don't worry, you're not in the wrong place. Because we also produce materials uh, and do work at the university level, uh, as well as for general audiences. We do believe um, that sc sc schools should teach and model sustainable practices. We do have a concentration in K-12 education, and our idea is that the entire school day uh, could serve to promote sustainability. And we realize that students need to experience and understand how nature sustains life. And I'll give you an idea of how important having experience of nature is, and sometimes in education where we're starting from. Um, a while back, we sponsored a group of children to come from the city uh, to have kind of a, a, an overnight experience. They went to Slide Ranch, and they got to be in the outdoors. Um, and that night, one of the boys who was maybe in fourth or fifth grade was sitting with his teacher, and he looked around and he said, what's that stuff up there? And what he was pointing to were the stars. But he lived in an urban area where the lights were always on at night, and he had never seen the stars before. So it's really hard to care about a planet and want to take care of a planet when you haven't had the experience yet that you are even on a planet. So how do you do that? Or how do any of us have that experience in a world that's already been so altered uh, by human activity? And we say you can start right where you are. A model that we have found really helpful is thinking of the whole school as an ecosystem. Uh, I don't know what your schooling is like, but sometimes school is kind of like this. It's a very isolated place. It's siloed from the rest of the community. Sometimes it literally has walls and fences around it. What you do there is not integrated with anything else that happens during your day. Uh, and what we are advocating is a model that's more like this is thinking of your school as being nested in a community, maybe in a town or in a city, connected to things that might be far away, like farms or places that provision you. Even if you can't see them, they are there and real and you are connected to them. And all of that is supported by natural systems. So using this kind of model, over the years, we were able to see really wonderful work. Um, this is an example of a school in Oakland with just some paint created a human sundial. Now, this is a girl who knows that she's on a planet in a solar system and understands Earth's place there. She also sees things like this where she understands that humans create things like language and other tools for interfacing with natural phenomenon. We have seen stupendous school gardens as education centers. The Center for Eco Literacy was the founding funder of the Edible Schoolyard. And we've seen some, uh, a particular, a uh, wonderful coastal school that integrated seaweed into their compost. This was an indigenous practice that they brought into the school. And students have that experience where if something from the ocean goes into the garden and then I eat something from the garden, does that mean that the ocean is now part of me and I'm connected to those bigger systems? And that sense of wonder and awe is something that can serve young people in having that profound experience of nature for the rest of their lives. 
and there have even been projects like this. This is students and teachers restoring a watershed. It's a um, program that we've been involved with so far. They've worked with 40,000 students restoring creeks and streams on farm and ranch land in the North Bay. So we have seen all this wonderful stuff, but we always say our primary job is to listen. And there was something that we were hearing again and again. We were being told inside of schools there was something happening every single day that directly contradicted everything that we wanted students to learn, and this is what it was. The quality of the food in schools. I don't know how much some of you may know about the National School Lunch Program. Uh, the amount of money available for each meal is modest, but the scale is enormous. Uh, there are seven billion school meals served every year in the United States. Some people are astonished to hear that the number is that big. The average public school student gets 35% of their daily calories at school, some kids get more than 50%. In California alone, almost one billion meals are served every year. And we were invited to take a look at a system like that and see if we had anything to contribute. So over a rather long period of time, we met with superintendents and food service directors and principals and educators, physicians, all kinds of people throughout health and food uh, to develop this, which is Rethinking School Lunch. It's a free resource you can get on our website, ecoliteracy.org. It's one of the most successful things we've ever done. If you amortize the downloads across the whole country, about six copies of this have been downloaded by every school district in the United States. Uh, it has uh, provided a lot of opportunities for us, including an incredible one in 2012, when we were invited by the Tomcat Ranch Educational Foundation to do a real systems thinking kind of approach to this, to work with one district intensively with the idea that it could become a model for others, and then see if that work could be expanded on a bigger scale to more districts. We had the luxury of scanning for the district we wanted to work with, and we were really fortunate to find a partner in our neighbor who was Oakland Unified. And we started a program called California Thursdays. The idea was we wanted somehow to do freshly prepared local food, so we just used the state um, as the boundary and encouraged schools to uh, get more and more local from there. Oakland was a school that had just been buying heat and served meals, so the idea was could they do a freshly prepared meal even once? Um, and that they were serving uh, prepared food doesn't mean that they didn't care about those kids, they were just on a very different business model. Um, to even do it once, you have to touch every part of your food system in the school. Uh, for example, if you want to serve something like kale, you might not even know where to buy it, and then what do you do when a ton, I mean literally a ton, of kale arrives at your school kitchen? So you have to think at kind of that level of scale and how you're going to handle it. Oakland serves 7 million meals a year, but believe it or not, one of the obstacles in the beginning of adopting this was they didn't have any measuring cups. So you run into big obstacles and small obstacles, but they did a really tremendous job. They started, they did it once, they did it once a week, and then they started going to more days of the week and went from meals that look like this to meals that look like this and like this. And we were really encouraged by the progress and we said, how can we grow it from there? So we launched an initiative called California Food for California Kids. It's the same principle, but to more districts. And here's where we are today. 92 school districts in California from 37 counties, about over 2 million kids, and almost 350 million meals a year. Now, not every one of those meals is a perfect locally grown meal yet. Schools are in different states of readiness. You know, some of them are just trying to get a functional kitchen, and then some districts like San Diego have the most amazing farm to school program and are doing great. So this is a process, it's not an event, but we're super encouraged by what people are doing and by the momentum this is happening. So what are some of the benefits? 
Well, first of all, improving children's health and academic achievement. Kids who are eating well are going to do better in school. Also, enhancing local economies. We have colleagues at Columbia University who are doing a study for us in the circular economy because when you start hiring locally and buying locally, that money begins to have multiplied benefits to the community, including to the um, families of the children who attend that school. There are environmental benefits, and there's many at different levels of scale. It includes the food doesn't travel as far, so you're not spending as much money on food. You are eliminating a lot of packaging. In processed food, sometimes half the cost of the meal is in the packaging because you pay for it twice. You pay for it once when you receive the meal, and you have to pay for it again when you dispose of it. Um, there's also a whole lot less food waste. We have seen food, food waste reduction so far as high as 85% because the food is great, and the kids are eating the meals instead of throwing them away. Um, longer term, a, a hope for us is that with the purchasing power that the districts have, they can become a big influencer on the food system in California. They can start saying things like, we would like to have produce that hasn't been sprayed because after all, we're serving it to children. Or we'd like to have a field trip to your farm, but we need to show them healthy organic practices. What are you doing? That kind of thing. And then one of the biggest things is incre in, uh, increasing students' ecological understanding of where their food comes from and how it reaches the table. I think there's a lot of adults who could um, perhaps benefit from that also. And that brings us right back to education for sustainable living and what I wanted to talk to you about today, which is understanding food and climate change. This was, these were the resources that were introduced at the United Nations. And I'm like gonna give you a preview of what is in this now. This happens to be optimized. Uh, here's the thing, we worked on audience really hard for this. So it's optimized for middle and high school, which means it's linked to standards. But we know that it, uh, we already know it's being used in colleges and beyond. We also wrote it in a way that it would be useful to advocates. So what I'm showing you is something that maybe in some way will, will be useful in your work and that you could regard as kind of a personal library of resources. So Chris, if you could just switch that for me out, great. Okay. Oh, I have to do something. Okay, so um, there's a lot of original video in this, um, this resource, but also some, uh, uh, I mean, there's a lot of curated video in this resource. We worked with wonderful organizations who uh, were so generous with us to uh, lend us their best stuff, but we also created some original video. So it'll work um, on any platform that you have. There's 16 different topics, and I'll just go through these. It looks like we won't be able to click on everything the way I had hoped. Um, certainly, we cover climate change basics. Again, I'm disappointed I can't show you the video, but I'll take questions anyhow. Systems thinking, which is so important in understanding how things are connected, even in ways they might not seem to be connected. There's uh, three sections. One is how climate change affects our food system. Also, how our food system affects climate change. And promising strategies for uh, addressing climate change. One thing we tried to do is to kind of wrap this whole thing in some hope. You know, you can motivate people up to a point by scaring them. But it's really having people, particularly young people who are inheriting a lot of these problems, feel that there really is something they can do. So, and I'm, let's just try one more thing, if, if we could, just to see. Could you click on this little guy up here, this little red dot? Get okay, now click here. This is about, you click on the bottom arrow. And then the 2011 arrow, perfect. There's a lot of interactives in here, and I'm sorry that it's so awkward to show them to you. But um, this kind of gives you an idea of something that's happening um, in Long Island Sound. This is what's happened to the lobster catch in 
1998, they were bringing in 3.7 million pounds of lobster. In 2011, 142,000. It was thinking for a while, they thought for a while that lobsters were migrating to the north, um, for example, up to Maine. But then it turns out what was happening is they just weren't maturing in Long Island Sound anymore because it was too warm. We also have extreme weather. Oh, and one thing I want to say, you don't, you can just maybe click, I'm so sorry, this is awkward. You can maybe just click on that screen and play it, does let play it, but this little video icon. Perfect. Um, we talk a lot about extreme weather. This is a really good, useful, all-purpose video for understanding what a storm is and how it forms, but included in the video that's part of this resource. Um, we really had a hustle, but we were able to get video from EPA, NASA, and NOAA before they were taken down by our government. I hope you all realize this, that um, after the last election, a whole lot of climate change resources were taken down off of government sites. So we were able to curate what we think is kind of a best of from those three resources, and they're available here too. temperature change. Um, at the center, we try to work on an attractor model. These are the kind of images you don't normally see associated with climate change. Then as you see kind of the burning desert stretching into the, the burning sun, and it's not that those things aren't real and that they might not get worse, but one thing we like to do sometimes is show beauty. We believe that beauty is a language and that it's the primary language of nature. Um, and also things that people love, like delicious food and beautiful things uh, that they might want to preserve. And that sometimes that's actually uh, a, a more productive way to open a conversation and also bring more people into thinking about how they want to preserve those things. This is a good example of connections that people might not realize. How could there possibly be any connection between ice caps in the Arctic and a bowl of rice that's harvested in Vietnam? Well, there is a connection when sea levels are rising and more salt water is coming into those rice paddies and the rice can't be grown anymore. Uh, food waste. I wonder if we can do this. Chris, you want to work with me on one more? Try it. Let's click. Portion size is a really great thing. And if you just want to, you could just click through these, showing how portion size has increased in the last 30 years. Um, and there's only one way, um, only one place that those um, calories can go. They either go into your body or they wind up in landfill, as we were talking about today. Um, I'm going to go on to one more. Um, and just show you something I, I neglected to mention, but that's particularly helpful if you are an educator. If you could just click on this for a minute. Right down here. On every, oh, oh no, okay, same problem, that didn't work. On every one of those pages, <laughs> this is so weird. On every one of those pages, there's a button. Um, and it's for activities. So if you do work with young people or students, there's a set of student activities and resources. So if you are an educator and you're saying, what can I do with this? We have proposed um, any number of activities that you could undertake. Some of them would be good on activities just to undertake on your own. Let's see, what do I want to do here? I'm afraid to try anything, so we're going to move on. There's really cool little interactives behind all three of these, unfortunately. And finally, some promising strategies. Let's see. This one is... This is particular in water management. It's a real, it was a really interesting thing to work on visually because when water is being managed correctly, you actually don't see any water uh, because it's being held in the soil. But I do want to show you uh, this. We tried to get as global a view as possible with a lot of this stuff. Chris, if you can just click on this little guy here with the turn. You're a great partner. Thank you for doing this. Um, I hope you can see these on this slide. These are things called zai that are in Africa, and it's an incredible way of making otherwise a non-formable land farmable. And here's how it works. They dig deep conical holes, and they put a seed at the bottom and throw in a little bit of organic matter. It might be manure or leaves or bark, whatever they've got. And when it rains, that 
conical hole fills up with water that very, very slowly seeps down. So it, uh, the seed has a chance to germinate, germinate and get established. But the amazing thing about the organic matter is that it attracts termites who build subterranean tunnels. And that helps the water filtrate and start to draw down that organic material to deeper layers too. So season after season of doing this, and what otherwise might seem like completely barren land, can make a field fertile. It's a really, really inspiring model. Reducing food waste. Again, there's little interactives in this and some terrific videos, but uh, some of the most inspiring models we've seen for reducing food waste come from schools. Um, there's a, there have been some relaxations of rules about how students can share food or take it home or something like that, which didn't used to be permitted in public schools. Uh, there's also a really nice uh, study that's been done by the University of Massachusetts at Amherst uh, where they've, di they did one thing. They eliminated trays in the cafeteria. So now you get a plate instead of a tray. And, and what they concentrated on was making the food great, and all you get is a, is a plate now. Just that one thing re reduced food waste by 30%. Because people are actually eating what they take which is really um, astonishing. It didn't cost a penny. In fact, it saves money. So there's all kinds of really creative solutions. And I can't show you video, unfortunately. I think two of the very best videos in this whole thing are here in the agroecology section. The one with chocolate is from the Isabel um, Agroforestry Project. Of almost all the people we talked to and dealt with, they were some of the most wonderful people. They've got an incredible thing going. They have a uh, mahogany hardwood forest. They've grown an understory of cacao. And that's the cash crop that makes it possible for them to do this kind of work. And then they've also introduced native legumes to help build the soil. Um, they, they, are, uh, they were absolutely tremendous and inspiring. They were the greatest. And then also, th these, are, these are my two favorite videos in the whole thing. The one from the Peruvian Andes, where they're growing almost 300 varieties of um, heritage potatoes there. It's, it's gorgeous because of the setting, the, the people's clothes and homes, and the potatoes themselves are every color and shape. They're really, really astonishing. So if you happen to, take, to look at this resource, I really recommend these two because they're knockouts. Soil strategy, it's what the conference is about here, and it's such a deep topic, but um, Again, a really great video on regenerative grazing practices. There's an interactive on cover crop. A lot of people might think they know what it is, but maybe they don't have an experience with it. So um, we have an interactive of it. It includes um, plants that you might be familiar with, you know, clovers and legumes and so forth. And even something I've seen happening um, in this area and in other parts of the country that's pretty inspiring, which is substituting native plants for some of the agriculture formerly agricultural plants. So instead of just planting bell beans, maybe they'd plant a native lupin instead and start to bring back a whole localized range ecology. And lastly, biodiversity. When I was working on this page, I thought, you know, these are three things. These are three living things. And they all live on the same planet. How is this even possible? Um, but uh, a real important role that, that agriculture can play is in assisting rather than obliterating biodiversity. I had the privilege of being on a very special trip to Bismarck, North Dakota a couple of years ago. I went with about 30 climate scientists from around the world. It was a tremendous trip. But they, they used a term out there that was new to me, but it was really helpful. And they talked about simplifying landscapes. And that that's something that we've done um, both in our cities and also in our agricultural areas. Kind of take everything out that's not the farm or not the ranch. And the various ways that uh, these ranchers 
who were pretty tremendous people, are trying to bring back a lot of this diversity, things that were considered obstacles, you know, like trees, stuff like that, and to really get, and to work with both agricultural animals and then native species to start to bring back um, biodiversity. Again, um, if you're an educator, this last part might be interesting to you because all the standards connections are there um, for next generation science standards and also Common Core. But um, that's, this is basically a tour of the resource. And since we're having a couple, we've had a number of technical problems, I might s stop here rather than trying to go any deeper. I want to thank you so much for your patience and kindness. And I wonder if you have any questions for me. Maybe not. <laughs> Yes. Oh, thanks. You, you know, I can't tell you right now about the charters just because I'm not sure. I'm sure someone I work with would know that. And I don't. Um, sometimes it's a little tricky with charters just because they may not be on the school lunch program, do they have a certain independence? It can vary from district to district, and I just don't happen to know about Oakland. Um, but they, they really were the test site for that whole idea and have been really great partners. Great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Okay, well, thank you so much again. Um, appreciate so much you being here.